Welcome back to Discrete Differential Geometry. Today we're going to continue our discussion of curvature, this time from the discrete side. And actually, we're going to look over the next two lectures at two complementary viewpoints on discrete curvature. One is the integral viewpoint, which we'll talk about today. And next time we'll talk about the variational viewpoint. Okay, so first before jumping into all the definitions, let's just take a look. What does curvature look like and what do we aim to do here? So our basic task is that we want to take a triangulated surface like this bunny and be able to compute many of the different notions of curvature that we talked about last time in our lecture on smooth curvature. So here you see I'm plotting the mean curvature, the Gauss curvature, the max and min principal curvatures. Um, I'm also plotting the area or some notion of area associated with vertices. And we're going to see that that's kind of a natural object that falls out of this discussion of curvatures. Area is kind of like a proto curvature in this setting. Um, Remember that in the smooth setting, we did have many different curvatures, normal, principal, Gauss, mean, geodesic curvature, and so forth. And in the discrete setting, if you look at what people have written on discrete curvature, it may appear that there are many disconnected and disparate ways to discretize these curvatures or talk about these curvatures on a triangle mesh. Actually, what we're going to see today is there's a very nice unified viewpoint that helps to explain that all of these different choices, or at least many of these different choices, all really kind of fit together in a very natural way. So by making some connections between smooth and discrete surfaces, we're going to get a unified picture of these many different discrete curvatures that are scattered throughout the literature. To tell this story, we're going to need a few pieces. So we're going to need to talk about uh, geometric derivatives, how do you differentiate quantities associated with a mesh in a nice way. We'll get more of that next time. Today we're going to talk a lot about Steiner polynomials, the Steiner viewpoint on curvature. Um, we're going to think about a sequence of variations of curvature. And we'll also need to draw on some basic theorems that we've started to talk about, like the Gauss-Bonnet theorem. Uh, we'll also see something called the Schlafly polyhedral formula, relationships between the Laplacian of the surface and the mean curvature, and so forth. So again, today we're going to start with the integral viewpoint that's going to take us through some of this crazy looking graph over here, explain what some of this means, and then cover the variational viewpoint in the next lecture, which will explain what the rest of this picture means. And by the end, hopefully you'll, you'll see what all these arrows and, and definitions and formulas mean and how they actually all come together and relate to, to each other in one single picture. Throughout, we're going to stick with some consistent quantities and conventions for talking about quantities on our discrete surface. So uh, we're going to consider the following basic quantities. Uh, as usual, we're going to say that f sub i is the position of vertex i, its location in three-dimensional space. We'll then say that eij is the vector from i to j, so fj minus fi. L sub ij is the length of the corresponding edge. A sub ijk is the area of the triangle with vertices ij and k. N sub ijk is the unit normal of that same triangle. Theta sub i superscript jk, that's going to indicate the interior angle at vertex i of triangle ijk. So the fact that i is the subscript is telling us which of the three corners of the triangle we're talking about. The angle phi sub ij is the dihedral angle associated with oriented edge ij, meaning the angle between the normals on either side of the edge. And what's important here is to keep track of orientation. If I'm going along edge ij, the dihedral angle is going in one direction. If I'm going along edge ji, it's going in the other direction. So to make this precise, we could write it out like this and say phi ij is equal to the arctangent of two arguments. 
First, the dot product of the unit edge vector Eij with the cross product Nijk cross Njil, and second, of the dot product of Nijk with Njil. If you know a little bit about the arctangent function, the idea is it takes two components of a vector in some plane and gives you the angle that that vector makes with the horizontal. The reason you give it two arguments is so that it can unambiguously figure out which angle you mean between 0 and 2 pi rather than just 0 to pi. Okay. One thing that's good to think about here, given that we've been studying exterior calculus and discrete differential forms, is to stop and think which, if any, of these quantities are discrete differential forms and what kind. Thinking about this is going to help you connect back these discrete quantities to some of the smooth quantities we've studied earlier on. For instance, you've already seen that the edge vectors E sub ij are a discrete differential one form. Right? If I reverse the orientation of the edge, then I negate the edge vector. And that's because these edges are really the integral of the differential of the surface. Right? Okay. We will begin our journey in understanding discrete curvature by looking at Gaussian curvature. And one of the key concepts we're going to need to really understand and appreciate this, this definition is the Euler characteristic. So for a polyhedral surface, the Euler characteristic is the constant chi equal v minus e plus f, where v is the number of vertices, e is the number of edges, and f is the number of faces. So just to give a sense of what this Euler characteristic looks like for a polygonal disk like we have on the far left, the Euler characteristic is 1. For an annulus like we have in the middle, it's equal to 0. And for a polyhedral sphere like we have on the right, it's equal to to 2. And if you want to, you can pause the video here and count the number of vertices, edges, and faces, and you'll find they really do add up to these numbers. Why am I so sure that these are the right Euler characteristics? Well, because I know that the Euler characteristic has to do with really nothing more than the topology of the polyhedral surface. So here's a nice fact, which is that the Euler characteristic is a topological invariant of a polyhedral surface. In other words, it doesn't depend at all on the vertex positions, where they are in space, or the particular choice of tessellation, how we've diced up that space into polygons. For a torus of genus G, for instance, we know that the Euler characteristic chi will always be equal to 2 minus 2G. So for a sphere, which has genus 0, it's actually not a torus, it has no handles, we get an Euler characteristic of 2. For a polyhedral torus, like the one we have here, we get an Euler characteristic of 2 minus 2 times 1, or 0. And for a two-handled torus, we get an Euler characteristic of minus 2. Okay, and again, it doesn't matter if we split, for instance, these quadrilaterals into two triangles, or we jiggle the vertices around, the Euler characteristic will remain the same. So how is this all related to curvature? Well, let's take a look at a different quantity, the angle defect. The angle defect at a vertex i, which we'll denote by capital omega sub i, is the deviation of the sum of interior angles from the Euclidean angle sum of 2 pi. Omega sub i is equal to 2 pi minus the sum over all triangles i, j, k that contain i of the interior angle theta sub i, j, k. So the intuition here is that if this were a set of triangles in the flat plane, then these angles would always sum to 2 pi, no matter how they were arranged, no matter how the triangles looked. And so the quantity omega is really capturing how much we're deviating from being in the flat plane, or kind of how curved we are. This makes a lot of sense if we go back and remember that in the smooth setting, we can think of the Gaussian curvature as a ratio of ball areas. 
So recall that the Gaussian curvature captures the deviation of the area of some small, really infinitesimal ball on the surface from a ball of the same radius in the plane. So loosely speaking, we can say the Gaussian curvature is proportional to 1 minus the area of the ball on the surface divided by the area of a ball of equal radius in the plane. And the picture really kind of tells the story here. If we have a very sharp peaked part of the surface like we do on the far left, then the area of the ball on the surface will be very small. As we get closer and closer to the flat plane, the area goes up. And in fact, if we had a saddle-like surface, the area on the surface for the same radius would be bigger than the ball in the plane and our Gaussian curvature would go negative. We can be more quantitative about this definition and say that uh, the relationship between the geodesic ball area, meaning the area of the ball on the surface, and the area of the ball in the plane has a constant of proportionality 1 minus k over 12 epsilon squared plus some terms that depend on the radius epsilon up to third order. Okay, so let's see how we can use this particular perspective of ratio of ball areas to get our hands on a definition for discrete Gaussian curvature. So for small radii epsilon, we have epsilon squared over 12 times the Gaussian curvature is roughly 1 minus the ratio of the ball on the surface to the ball in the plane. In the discrete case, we're going to consider just a vertex star. And first think about the area of a Euclidean ball. So the area of a Euclidean ball of radius epsilon is just pi epsilon squared. On the surface, we can also compute, without much trouble, the area of a geodesic wedge. So this thing I've marked as W sub i. What is the area of that little piece if I have a ball of radius epsilon? Well, it's just the fraction of a whole ball, theta i over 2 pi, times the area of the Euclidean ball. In other words, 1 half epsilon squared theta i. So the total area of a geodesic ball, assume that this vertex neighborhood isn't flat now, is just going to be the sum of these wedge areas. So epsilon squared over 2 times the sum over i of theta i, meaning the sum of all the wedges around the vertex. In this case, we have this relationship, right? Epsilon squared over 12 times k is equal to 1 minus 1 over 2 pi times the sum of these interior angles theta i. Or equivalently, we have 2 pi minus the sum of interior angles is equal to 1 sixth pi epsilon squared k. Right? So what does this look like? This looks like the Gaussian curvature times the area of a ball of radius epsilon up to a constant. And so we can think of the angle defect as not the Gaussian curvature directly, but as an integral of Gaussian curvature over a region around the vertex. And something that's important to think about here is that if we make the ball a little bit smaller or a little bit bigger, this integral is the same. Right? So this is a pretty canonical definition for Gaussian curvature, or really integrated Gaussian curvature, at a vertex. We can also get at this same definition from a more extrinsic point of view. Remember in our lecture on curvature, we said these are two complementary views of curvature, thinking about how vectors vary in space, the extrinsic point of view, versus thinking about comparison of quantities like areas in the curved case and the Euclidean case. Okay, so this time we're going to consider the discrete Gauss map, meaning we have our unit vectors on the surface, our triangle normals, and those become points on the unit sphere. We can connect up these points on the sphere, and, and we can also connect them to the center of the sphere, and we're going to get a new vertex star, so a figure that looks like the one on the left, except now the tip of this figure is at the center of the sphere, and the five points around are points on the unit sphere corresponding to the normals of the original mesh. Some interesting things happen here. 
So for one thing, dihedral angles on the surface, meaning the angle between two normals, become interior angles on this new triangulation. Right? You see that? Likewise, um, interior angles on the original surface become dihedral angles on this new triangulation. Now that takes a little more thought. What we realize is the cross product of two consecutive normals is one of the edge vectors. And the interior angles on this new figure are kind of found from the dot product of two edge vectors. Okay? So basically the interior angles and the dihedral angles switch roles. What we can then see is that the angle defect on the surface becomes an area on the sphere. The area of this spherical polygon is the same as 2 pi minus the sum of these angles. Really working that out carefully takes a little work, and that's something you'll do in your homework. Okay, so now that we have that picture of angle defect as an area on the sphere, we can think about what's going on a little more globally. So let's consider a closed convex polyhedron in R3, like this icosahedron. And we have a question. So given that we know each angle defect is some area on the sphere, some little piece of the sphere, what might you guess about the total angle defect over the whole polyhedron, meaning the sum of all those omega sub i's? Okay, well, if you've been following this picture so far, you'll quickly realize this is just going to be equal to the area of the unit sphere. These little areas are going to partition the sphere into pieces, in this case, into little pentagons. And in fact, you can argue that the total e angle defect is always going to be equal to 4 pi for any polyhedron with spherical topology, not just convex. Right? As long as it doesn't have any handles or holes, the sum of those angle defects will always be equal to 4 pi. Pretty, pretty cool. Okay, so here's a theorem. More generally, for any polyhedron of genus G, the total angle defect is equal to 2 pi times 2 minus 2 G. Does that theorem remind you of anything? Hopefully, you remember that that's very much like our statement of the Gauss-Bonnet theorem. So remember, the Gauss-Bonnet theorem says for a smooth surface, that the total Gaussian curvature of the interior plus the total geodesic curvature along the boundary is always equal to 2 pi times the Euler characteristic chi, which, okay, for a surface of genus G was 2 minus 2G. What did this mean, right? What was the, the concept behind this Gauss-Bonnet theorem? It really was saying if we have some nice surface M, and we add bumps on the interior or we wiggle the boundary around a little bit, it doesn't matter. This total curvature will always be preserved. This total curvature, meaning Gaussian plus geodesic curvature, is a topological invariant. Well, this total angle defect theorem is really a discrete analog of Gauss-Bonnet. It's saying the same thing. If we move the vertices around, whether they're interior vertices or boundary vertices, we should get the same total angle defect. Ah, but we didn't consider one thing. I mean, we haven't really said anything yet about polyhedral surfaces with boundary. So let's talk about that now. So how do we talk about curvature on the boundary of a polyhedral or, or really simplicial surface? So we said that this angle defect, omega sub i, provides a discrete analog of Gaussian curvature. And intuitively, what is it measuring? It's saying, how badly does this vertex uh, fail to be flattenable into the plane? How much does the angle sum around the vertex deviate from the Euclidean angle sum of 2 pi? What does it tell us for a boundary vertex? Right? If we consider a boundary vertex like this one, well, actually, not much. Every boundary vertex can be flattened into the plane without any kind of stretching at all. 
And so really the right way of thinking about boundary vertices is to say they have no Gaussian curvature. It's impossible for a boundary vertex to have Gaussian curvature. Okay? However, we can still measure how straight the boundary itself is. How straight is the boundary curve? In other words, we can assign a notion of discrete geodesic curvature to the boundary of the surface. What we're going to use is this quantity here, kappa sub i, little kappa sub i, which is now pi minus the sum of interior angles incident on that vertex. So kappa is really this exterior angle. And we're getting it by summing up all these interior angles that touch vertex i and subtracting them from pi. By the way, this is exactly the same as our definition of discrete curvature for a plane curve, or at least one of our definitions, the one based on the turning angle. Okay. So finally, we can really state the full discrete gauss bonnet theorem. Again, in the smooth setting, we said for a smooth surface M with Gauss curvature K and geodesic curvature kappa sub G, the integral over the surface of the Gaussian curvature plus the integral over the boundary of the geodesic curvature is equal to 2 pi chi. Now we have a perfect discrete analog. For a simplicial surface, K, with vertices V, edges E and faces F, with interior angle defects omega sub i and boundary angle defects kappa sub i, the sum over all interior vertices of the angle defect plus the sum over all boundary vertices of the discrete geodesic curvature is equal to the same thing, 2 pi chi. So again, by integrating or by summing up all the curvature over a surface, we get to see something about its global topology. And this is an important example in differential geometry of what's called a local global theorem. Something where by looking kind of under a microscope at what's going on on the surface, just looking at little local neighborhoods, we can infer some information about what's going on in the broader picture. Now, it's important to say that this is not the only way to get your hands on something like Gaussian curvature. There are lots of different approximations you could cook up. For instance, I could do a local fit of the vertex positions to a quadratic function, get something like a paraboloid, and then I could just go ahead and compute the smooth Gaussian curvature of that approximating surface. Which of these approaches is better? Which one is best? Well, the answer is there is no best way. Every way you do this is going to have different pros and cons. So on the one hand, values from this quadratic fit won't satisfy any kind of gauss bonnet theorem. Right? There's no clear sense in which if I add up the values I compute for every triangle in this case, why they should add up to 2 pi chi. On the other hand, there are things that you could critique about the angle defect definition of Gaussian curvature. One thing that we know, for instance, is that angle defects cannot converge to the true smooth values of Gaussian curvature under refinement unless the valence or the degree of the vertex is either 4 or 6. A little bit of a surprising fact. In general, there really is no best way. Right? Again, every way that you come up with to discretize or approximate something from the smooth setting will fail to capture some property that you care about. There are almost always these no free lunch theorems. And so rather than seeking this best answer, what's really valuable to do is try to understand the landscape of possibilities and when you should apply a certain definition in a certain context. Okay, so let's move on from Gaussian curvature and look at some of these other curvature quantities that we can associate with a surface. And one that we saw that was pretty cool was this vector area, which we motivated by saying we want to get an average or sort of total normal over some surface patch. And the neat thing we saw is that this average normal really depends only on the shape of the boundary of the surface and not anything that's going on inside. 
In fact, this two form is one of three basic quantities that we can naturally associate with a surface and its Gauss map. So the way we wrote it down last time is we said we can write it as a differential form, one half df wedge df. If we do something similar, but now with both the surface f and the Gauss map n, right, the positions and the normals, we get one half df wedge dn is equal to the mean curvature normal, meaning the mean curvature of the surface times its normal vector times the area form. Okay? And completing the picture, we can look at one half dn wedge dn, which gives us the Gauss curvature normal. So now something like the Gaussian curvature in the normal direction. These are what are called sort of mixed areas, mixed areas of ordinary surface area and area on the sphere. We're mixing together. If you remember that we can think of the Gauss map as also describing a surface, then the first expression here is really giving us the area on the original surface. The last expression is giving us the area on the Gauss map, telling us that you know, Gaussian curvature has something to do with area on the Gauss map. And mean curvature, interestingly enough, is kind of a mix between these two. In one direction, it's the area on the surface. In another direction, it's an area on the sphere. Okay? To show that these equalities hold and to really get a sense of what's going on here, let's just review for a second this notion of principal curvature. So remember, the principal directions x1 and x2 describe the directions of minimal and maximal bending. For instance, on the cylinder, right? We know that in one direction, the normal's not changing at all. In the other direction, it's turning around pretty quickly right? in, the, in the circular direction. And one thing that's important to remember is kind of our conventions. When we talk about vectors, we have the vectors in the parameter domain here, x1 and x2. And then we can push those vectors forward into R3 and get the corresponding vectors in space, df of x1 and df of x2. Okay, and when talking about these principal directions, we have a key relationship that's going to be really, really helpful in a lot of derivations in surface theory. So we said that the change in the normal in the ith principal direction is equal to the ith principal direction itself, now as a vector in three-dimensional space, times the ith principal curvature. And we can really see that happening here on the cylinder. If we walk in the direction x2, the normal is going to rotate around the cylinder. And so we're going to get a change in space that points in the direction df of x2 and has magnitude equal to 1 over the radius of the cylinder. If we walk in the other direction, x1, well, we can imagine we have now a vector in space that's pointing along these other parameter lines, the normal isn't changing at all, so we multiply it by zero, by the other principal curvature. Okay? So how can we get these expressions we had for curvature normals? Well, for any surface F with normals N, we have df wedge df of x1, x2 is df of x1 cross df of x2, minus df of x2 cross df of x1. Because the cross product is anti-symmetric, we can swap, let's say, the second term, and we get 2 df of x1 cross df of x2. Since df of x1 and df of x2 are two tangent vectors on the surface, in particular they are principal directions, their cross product is going to point in the normal direction. And what we're really doing is measuring the area spanned by these two vectors. So we get 2 times the normal times the area element applied to our two arguments. And so from that, because it holds not only for x1 and x2, but for all pairs of tangent vectors, we can deduce that df wedge df is equal to 2 nda. Similarly, let's say we take df wedge dn and apply it to the two principal directions. This time, it's actually going to be really important that our inputs are the principal directions. Right? So we start out the same way. We expand the definition of the wedge product, and we get df of x1 cross dn of x2 minus df of x2 cross dn of x1. 
And using the relationship we had on the previous slide, we can turn dn of x2 into kappa 2 df of x2 and dn of x1 into kappa 1 df of x1. Okay. Again, we can flip one of our terms and we end up with kappa 1 plus kappa 2 df of x1 cross df of x2. Now, if you remember, our definition of mean curvature was, well, it was the mean of the two principal curvatures, kappa 1 plus kappa 2 over 2. So we can also write this expression as 2 times h, the mean curvature, times the normal, times the area element applied to x1 and x2. As before, this equality will hold for any pair of tangent vectors. We just used a particularly special choice, x1 and x2, to make the derivation really simple to figure out. Right? The curvature really just falls out of this calculation. Okay, finally, we can do the same thing for dn wedge dn. We get dn x1 cross dn x2 minus dn x2 cross dn x1. We pull the principal curvatures outside of the dn terms. On both terms, we get kappa 1 times kappa 2. We flip the second term, and this becomes 2k df x1 cross df x2. And we can also write that cross product as n dA. So in the end, we get that dn wedge dn is equal to twice the Gaussian curvature times the normal times the area element. Okay, so this is pretty cool. Just starting with the position and the normals, all of the kind of most basic curvatures come out, the Gaussian and the mean curvature, and also the area or the vector area. What does this look like in the discrete setting? Okay, so recall again that we can write the smooth vector area as the integral of the normal over a surface. And by Stokes' theorem, that's the same as integrating over the boundary the position of the surface times the tangent divided by 2. So how can we get a discrete version of this quantity? Well, let's just go ahead and integrate it over some region of our mesh. In particular, we can think about integrating it over the dual cell, this blue region, around the vertex P. And actually, because our normals are constant on each triangle, that's the same as integrating over the whole vertex star and dividing by 3. Okay, So I can write this as 1 third, the integral over the whole vertex star of the normal with respect to area. That's by our formula above, the same as 1 sixth, the integral over the boundary of the vertex star, f cross df. Okay, here's finally where things get interesting. I can say, well, the boundary of the vertex star is a collection of edges. So I can write this integral as a piecewise integral, where I sum up the contributions from each edge. So I'm going to sum over all edges ij that go around the vertex p, of the integral over that edge, eij, of f cross df. Now we have to think a little bit here. Now what does f and df mean for just an edge? We have a curve in space that's just a little line segment. Well, df, the differential, is going to be constant along this edge. Loosely speaking, it looks like the tangent, right? and f is linear. So together we have something linear times something constant, which is a linear function. To integrate a linear function, we can just grab the value at the midpoint and multiply by the size of the domain. When we do this, we get 1 sixth, the sum over all of these same edges of fi plus fj over 2 cross fj minus fi, right? We have the position at the midpoint, cross product with the edge vector. Now, if we're clever, we can actually rewrite this by considering the fact that it's a cyclic sum as an even simpler expression, which is just 1 sixth, the sum over all those edges, of the cross product of consecutive positions. We do f1 cross f2 plus f2 cross f3 and so on. What kind of quantity is this, by the way, in terms of discrete exterior calculus? 
Well, we integrated a differential two form over a two cell, a two dimensional region. And because this cell comes from the dual complex, we say that this is a dual discrete differential two form. Okay? Let's look at the next curvature vector, the discrete mean curvature normal. Okay, so similarly, integrating Hn, mean curvature times the normal, over a circumcentric dual cell C is going to give us, well, let's see, integral over C of Hn dA. We said that we can write Hn dA as df wedge dN. Or I can flip the two terms and write this as integral over C of dN wedge df. Now, we have to stop for a minute and think, why didn't I introduce a minus sign here? And the reason is because we're working with R3 valued differential forms, vector valued forms defined in terms of the anti-symmetric cross product. And so if you write out these two wedge products, they will indeed turn out to be the same. Okay. From here, I can notice that the integrand can also be written as D of N wedge DF. Why is that true? Well, if I apply the D, I get dn wedge df plus n wedge ddf, but dd is zero. Okay? And that's nice because now I've expressed this as an integral of a derivative, which means I can immediately apply which theorem? Stokes theorem, right? I can turn this into an integral over the boundary where I remove the derivative d. Okay. Here's where it gets interesting. So now I can say specifically on a triangulated surface, I'm going to write this as a piecewise integral. Now, unlike before, I'm really going to keep integrating over the boundary of this region C. I'm not going to extend this to an integral over the entire vertex star. Right? I'm going to integrate over this dashed line. And I'm going to break it up into a sum for each neighbor j of the center vertex i of the integral over the associated dual edge e star i j, right, the little edge that crosses i j, of n wedge df. If I call the endpoints a and b, and I let m be the midpoint where this dual edge meets the primal edge, then, then I can also write this integral as n a cross m minus a plus n b cross b minus m. Okay? Here comes the interesting trick. So n a is the normal in triangle a, n b is the normal in triangle b. Since n cross a vector is a 90 degree rotation in the plane of that normal, both terms in this sum end end up being parallel to the same edge vector Eij. Okay? And when I sum up these two terms, I'm going to get a vector whose length is still equal to the length of the dual edge. Right? So I can remember that the ratio of the dual length over the primal length is given by the cotangent formula, which lets me write the final mean curvature normal in this really slick expression. The mean curvature normal at vertex i is equal to 1 half the sum over all ordinary edges from i to neighbors j of cotan alpha ij plus cotan beta ij times fi minus fj. Put more simply, I'm taking a weighted sum of the edge vectors that touch vertex i. The weights in that sum are the cotan weights. Okay, so at this point, many of you are thinking, all right, we did some weird and complicated derivation to get some weird and complicated expression for the mean curvature. Well, as often happens in discrete differential geometry, it turns out this expression is not arbitrary it actually will show up over and over again as we try to come at mean curvature from different angles. So here's a completely different approach. Another well-known fact in 
differential geometry of surfaces is that the mean curvature, or the mean curvature normal, can be expressed using the Laplace Beltrami operator. Basically, the thing that is the generalization of the ordinary Laplace operator to curved surfaces. In particular, if we have any smooth immersed surface F, then applying the Laplacian to the immersion F will give us the mean curvature normal up to a factor of two. Okay, And so if we take a different path and we discretize the operator delta, we discretize the Laplacian, well, naturally what comes out are, again, the cotan weights. And so we get, again, the same expression for the discrete mean curvature normal. Sum over all the edges of the cotan weights times the edge vectors. We're going to see in our next lecture actually yet a third way that this mean curvature normal shows up by doing area variations. And this is what you really like to see in discrete differential geometry. You have a bunch of relations that hold in the smooth setting. One by one, you discretize them into the discrete setting. If over and over again, a lot of these expressions produce the same result, then you have this feeling that, yeah, this is real. This is really a canonical way to talk about this quantity. In this case, the mean curvature. Okay, so we'll talk a lot more about the Laplacian in future lectures. For now, let's move on to our final curvature normal, the discrete Gauss curvature normal. Okay, so a very similar calculation is going to give us an expression. One key difference, though, is that instead of viewing the Gauss map n as being linear along the edges, as we did with f, we're going to imagine that it makes an arc on the unit sphere. Okay, and this is pretty natural. We think of n as taking us from points on the surface to points on the sphere. When we interpolate between two points on the sphere, it's much more natural to follow the sphere itself than to make a straight line through space. So let's see how this plays out. Okay, so we're going to integrate, again, over this dual cell C, the Gaussian curvature times the normal. Using my earlier calculation, I can also write this as the integral of dn wedge dn. I can express the integrand as d of n wedge dn. I can apply Stokes theorem to get a boundary integral of n wedge dn. And then I'm going to think a little bit about what integration of differential forms means. So in this case, dn is my differential one form. As I walk along the boundary, what am I going to do? I just take the unit tangent along the boundary and I plug it into dn. Right, so I can also write this integral as n cross dn of gamma prime with respect to arc length, or in other words, n cross the unit tangent of the curve with respect to arc length. Okay, what curve am I thinking about? So here's the picture. The Gauss map takes me to the sphere. The region I'm integrating over really is this polygon on the sphere that corresponds to the image of the vertex neighborhood under the Gauss map. Okay, And as I go around the boundary of this region, I can again break it up into a piecewise integral, where each piece is an arc connecting consecutive normals, gamma sub ij. All right, T here, the tangent, is actually a tangent on the sphere. And it's useful, I think, to look at this from kind of a side view. So now I'm looking at this curve from the side. I know that nijk cross njil, the two consecutive normals, are going to be orthogonal to the edge that they share. So I'm really viewing this picture by looking down the edge eij. OK? And this is what I now want to integrate. Along gamma ij, I want to integrate n cross t. Well, as we just said, n cross t is pointing out of this plane. It's parallel to the vector eij. Okay, so I can write this actually as the sum over all my neighbors j of the integral over the boundary of 
the edge vector eij divided by its length. I know that t cross n will always be a unit vector. Alternatively, I could write this as the sum over j of eij divided by lij times the arc length on the sphere, right? I'm integrating something constant with respect to arc length, so I just multiply by the length of the arc gamma ij. Well, the length of the arc gamma ij is the same as the dihedral angle between nijk and njil. If your head is spinning right now, this might be a good moment to pause and go back to our slide where we talked about the image of a vertex neighborhood under the Gauss map and how interior angles become dihedral angles and dihedral angles become interior angles. Once you get that picture in your head, all of this becomes a little easier to follow. Okay, so for a final expression, we can replace Eij, the edge vector, with Fj minus Fi, and we find that the Gauss curvature normal associated with vertex i is one half the sum over all edges touching i of the dihedral angle of that edge divided by the length of that edge times fj minus fi. So we get a formula that looks very much like the classic cotan formula, but we have different weights. Rather than the cotan weights, we have dihedral angle divided by edge length. This again is going to come up for us later on in a very natural way. Okay, so here's a summary of what we've done so far. We said there are kind of three basic quantities we can associate with a surface, the area, the mean curvature, and the Gauss curvature. Actually, we're going to consider the vector versions of those. The area vector, the mean curvature vector, the Gauss curvature vector, or Gauss curvature normal. In the smooth setting, we can write those quantities very easily by wedging together f and f, or f and n, or n and n pretty slick. And in the discrete case, when we just go ahead and integrate those quantities around a vertex, we get some very nice little formulas. We get a formula for the area vector, which is just summing up cross products of positions around the vertex. We get an expression for the mean curvature normal, which is just the classic cotan formula. And we get an expression for the Gauss curvature normal, which looks very much like the cotan formula, except we have a different set of weights. Okay, let's move on to a different way of thinking about discrete curvature based on something called Steiner's formula. So we're faced again with this question, what is the curvature of a discrete surface of a polyhedron? And if we're naive about this and we just try to go ahead and take derivatives of the surface in the usual way, in the way that we would find in a classic textbook on differential geometry, we're going to get a useless answer. We're going to find that the curvature is zero almost everywhere, right in the middle of all these faces. And then at the vertices or the edges, well, the derivative is ill-defined. We kind of imagine, well, maybe it goes to infinity or, you know, it becomes really hard to talk about in a meaningful way. So Steiner's approach is to say, how about we, instead of thinking about this polyhedral surface directly, let's smooth it out a little bit. If we smooth it out just ever so slightly, then it'll actually become a smooth surface, and we can define our curvature in the usual way. Now we're going to take the limit of this smoothing process, going from this smooth version back toward the original sharp polyhedron, and the limit of our curvature expressions as the smoothing goes to zero will be how we define the discrete curvature. Really nice point of view. To make sense of this, we have to define what's called the Minkowski sum. So in general, if I have two sets A and B in Rn, their Minkowski sum is the set of points A plus B. How do you define the sum of two sets? Well, here's one way. A plus B is the set of all points A plus B such that A is in A and B is in B. Sounds pretty simple. What does it look like geometrically? Well, here are a couple examples. So let's say we start out with this set A, just 
six points in the plane. And let's say B is this set, this blue set of four points in the plane. What is the Minkowski sum A plus B going to look like? Try to picture this in your head. Okay, it's going to look something like this. This green set. So around every point from A, we have a copy of B. Here's another example. Let's say A is this red pentagon, and B is now not a point, but actually a little disk of some radius. What is the Minkowski sum of the red polygon with the blue disk going to look like? Well, it looks like this. It looks like a rounded version of the red polygon. Why is that? Well, we can imagine that what we did is we took that little blue disk and we swept it over every point in the red polygon. We put the center of the blue disk at every point in that red polygon. And the region that it traced out in the plane is this green region. Okay. One thing to think about here, especially given the way I've drawn these pictures, is does the translation of A and B matter? If I move A to the right a little bit, is it going to affect the Minkowski sum? Or if I move B up a little bit? Sure. If I translate A or B, the Minkowski sum is also going to translate, but it's not really going to have an effect on the shape that I get out as a result. Okay? So, this is going to be our basic technique for smoothing out or mollifying a polyhedral surface. We're going to take a Minkowski sum with a small ball. For instance, let's consider what it looks like in the vicinity of any vertex of a triangulated surface. So if we take a Minkowski sum with a small ball, then every vertex just becomes a copy of this ball. For every edge, we kind of sweep out a cylindrical piece. For every face, we kind of just push the face out in the normal direction. And if we glue all these pieces together, then our new mollified vertex neighborhood looks something like this. It looks like a rounded version of what we started with. Our strategy then for getting a definition of discrete curvature is to say, hey, we're in good shape. We have now a nice, pretty smooth looking surface. We can just measure the curvature in the ordinary way and then take the limit as epsilon goes back down to zero to get a discrete definition. Now, one small word of warning, which is that to really do this right, we have to be careful about non-convex polyhedra. But in the end, the same formulas for discrete curvature will hold. Okay? So, Steiner has this nice formula that says if A is any convex body in Rn, and B sub epsilon is a ball of radius epsilon, then the volume of the Minkowski sum A plus B epsilon can be expressed as a polynomial in epsilon. In particular, the volume of A plus B epsilon, meaning the Minkowski sum, is equal to the volume of A plus the sum from k equals 1 up through the dimension of the space of capital phi sub k of a times epsilon to the k. Right? A polynomial in epsilon. These coefficients phi sub k, we haven't said what they are yet, but they have a special name. They're called the Quermas integrals, or the cross-dimension integrals, more or less. And what they do is they describe how quickly the volume grows as we increase the radius of the ball epsilon. What we're going to see is that this volume growth is actually related to curvature. It's going to give us a notion of discrete curvature. Now, before we work all of this out, just a couple reminders of some basic geometric formulas. So, first of all, the surface area of the sphere. You may remember that if I have a sphere of radius r, its area is 4 pi r squared. 
is kind of interesting. What that means is if I take four disks that all have the same radius as the sphere, I should exactly be able to cover the sphere with these four disks. I'm not quite sure how to do it, but I, I do know that it's, it's possible. Okay. Surface area of a cylinder is maybe even easier. If I have a cylinder of radius r and length l, then its surface area is 2 pi r l, if I don't worry about the end caps. Why is that true? Well, imagine that I cut this cylinder open and I just roll it out in the plane. Then all I have is a rectangle whose height is l and whose width is 2 pi r. More generally, and we're going to use this fact a lot, if I have now just a, a piece of the cylinder made by an angle phi, then the area of that piece is going to be pi r l. Of course, this is the general case of what we just said before. If we have the whole cylinder, then phi is equal to 2 pi. Okay? So let's use this idea of rounding out the polyhedron to get a notion of discrete Gaussian curvature. Okay, so we have a question. Consider a closed convex polyhedron in R3. What's the Gaussian curvature K of the mollified surface for a ball of radius R? So we take our initial surface, a tetrahedron, a cube, whatever, we smooth it out. We want to know what is the Gaussian curvature. Well, we can break this up into different pieces. We can look at the Gaussian curvature contributed by vertices, contributed by edges, and contributed by triangles. Triangles are the easiest, right? The triangles, when we mollify the surface, they just get pushed out in the normal direction. So we get the same set of triangles, they're still flat, they contribute no Gaussian curvature. For the edges, we sweep the ball along the edge and we get a little cylindrical piece. And we can remember the Gaussian curvature is the product of the two principal curvatures. In this case, since the smaller principal curvature is zero, there's some direction along which a cylinder does not bend, the product is also zero. The Gaussian curvature is zero. So, so far, there's no contribution to Gaussian curvature coming from the triangles or the edges. What that means is that all the action is going to happen at the vertices. In particular, this idea that the normals uh, around the vertex turn into a polygon on the sphere becomes really concrete in this case, right? If I look at the spherical cap on this mollified surface, it really looks like that polygon that I get in the image of the discrete Gauss map, right? So each vertex is now really going to become a piece of a sphere of radius epsilon. A sphere of radius epsilon has Gaussian curvature 1 over epsilon squared. That's the product of two principal curvatures that are both 1 over epsilon. Okay. Remember also that the area on the unit sphere is equal to the angle defect omega i. Right, so we can use omega i as a nice quantity in an expression where we want to talk about this spherical cap. In particular, the total curvature associated with vertex i is going to be the area of this spherical piece times the Gaussian curvature of this spherical piece. The area is just what fraction of the whole sphere is covered in the Gauss map times the area of a sphere of radius epsilon. So omega i over 4 pi times 4 pi epsilon squared. The Gaussian curvature of the sphere is 1 over epsilon squared. When we simplify this, we just get omega i. So let's be, be sure we're, we're thinking about what we're saying here. This quantity is the Gaussian curvature of that little spherical piece on our mollified surface. And what we just discovered, a little surprisingly, is no matter what epsilon is, no matter how much we rounded out the surface, the total Gaussian curvature of that little piece is always the same. And it's always equal to the angle defect. So this really gives us another good justification for using angle defect as a notion of discrete Gaussian curvature. We started with a completely different point of view than thinking about ratios of areas on the surface, and we got the same formula. 
for the whole surface then, the total Gaussian curvature is just going to be the sum over all the vertices of all the angle defects. And hopefully you remember that that sum is a topological invariant. It's equal to 2 pi chi. How about the mean curvature? What's the mean curvature h of our mollified surface? Well, let's go again piece by piece. So faces are still flat. They have no curvature whatsoever, definitely not mean curvature. The edges, again, are these little cylindrical pieces, and now they are going to contribute something because the mean curvature is the average of the principal curvatures. The cylinder has at least one principal curvature that's not zero. So each edge contributes a piece of a cylinder. The cylinder has mean curvature 1 over 2 epsilon, right? because it's the average of 0 and 1 over epsilon. And if Lij is the length and Phij is the dihedral angle at this edge, then the area of this cylindrical piece is going to be Lij times Phij times epsilon. This cylinder has a particular radius epsilon, which means the total mean curvature for the edge is going to be the product of the area times the mean curvature. It's going to be 1 half Lij Phij. Again, we notice that the total mean curvature associated with the edge has nothing to do with the choice of this parameter epsilon. It doesn't matter how much we smoothed out the surface, we're always going to get the same total mean curvature. Okay, finally, what about the vertices? So each vertex actually contributes now something that does have mean curvature. These little spherical caps have curvature 1 over epsilon in every direction, which means the average curvature is, well, 1 over epsilon. The area of the little spherical piece, as we talked about on the last slide, is the fraction of the unit sphere we cover, omega i over 4 pi, times the area of a sphere of radius epsilon, 4 pi epsilon squared. In other words, the area is omega i epsilon squared, hence the mean curvature contributed by the vertex is omega i epsilon. Okay, this time we notice that actually as epsilon goes to zero, as we smooth the surface less and less and less and less, the vertices aren't contributing anything to the mean curvature. It's really the edges that are capturing the mean curvature. Okay, For the whole mollified surface, we have a total mean curvature, mean of epsilon, is equal to 1 half sum over all the edges of edge lengths times dihedral angles plus sum over all vertices, epsilon times angle defects. All right. What other quantities can we measure about this mollified surface? I mean, so far we've been measuring curvatures, but we can do something more basic. We could ask just what's the area of our smoothed out surface? Well, the faces have their original area. They just got pushed out some distance. The edges, we've already computed the area. It's the length, Lij, times the dihedral angle, Phij, times the radius epsilon. The vertices have area omega i times epsilon squared, where epsilon, again, is the radius of our ball. And so what that means is that the total area of the whole surface is sum over all the faces of the original triangle areas plus epsilon times the sum over edges of edge lengths times dihedral angles plus epsilon squared times the sum of all the angle defects. And if you want, you could simplify that last term using discrete gauss bonnet to just 2 pi chi. Let's keep going. What are other properties we can talk about for this smoothed out surface? How about the volume enclosed by the surface? Well, at this point, hopefully, we're starting to see a pattern. In particular, if V naught is the original volume, the volume of the unsmoothed surface, then the volume of the mollified surface for a radius epsilon is the original volume V naught plus epsilon times the sum of the areas, plus 1 half epsilon squared times the sum of edge lengths times dihedral angles, plus 1 third epsilon cubed 
times the sum of all the angle defects. Hopefully you can at least get some idea of how we might get to this expression. Right? To sketch it out, what we did here is we said faces are going to add slabs of thickness epsilon, hence volume epsilon times sum of areas. Edges are going to add little cylindrical wedges of volume 1 half lij phi ij epsilon squared because a cylinder has volume pi r squared l. Vertices are going to add little spherical cones of volume 1 third omega i epsilon cubed because a sphere has volume or a ball has volume 4 pi r cubed over 3. Okay. What's important here, what's important for all of this is not the particulars of these calculations, but to see that this pattern is emerging in our expressions for the Gauss curvature, the mean curvature, the area, the volume. They all look quite similar. What is going on here? Well, what we're seeing is that the volume of the mollified polyhedron is a polynomial in this radius epsilon, the ball radius, okay? And if we take derivatives of the volume with respect to epsilon, we're going to recover all these other quantities. Isn't that fascinating? So, for instance, if we take the derivative of volume with respect to epsilon, we get the area of the smoothed out surface. If we take the derivative of area with respect to epsilon, we get the mean curvature, actually up to a factor of two. If we take the derivative of mean curvature, we get the Gauss curvature. And finally, if we take the derivative of the total Gauss curvature with respect to epsilon, we get zero. We get to the end of this sequence. Why, by the way, do we get to the end there? Why is the derivative of Gauss curvature with respect to epsilon zero? Well, again, because Gauss curvature is a topological invariant. It doesn't matter if we change the geometry of the surface, the Gauss curvature is not changing. Okay? But this is really the, the Steiner view. It's saying, do you want to get your hands on all the quantities associated with a surface? Well, just start with the volume and start taking derivatives. Okay? Not surprisingly, there's an analogous formula for smooth surfaces in R3. We can go from the discrete back into the continuous. So if we take a Minkowski sum with a small ball of radius epsilon greater than zero, that's the same as shifting the surface in the normal direction by epsilon. Okay, so here's kind of a cross-section view. This is what's going to happen to our surface. We're going to thicken the surface and we're going to get an inner and outer surface that are shifted by epsilon. Another way we could write this down is to consider a parameterized surface F, which has a Gauss map N, and we're going to consider a family of surfaces F sub T equal to F plus T N. So starting at time zero, we have our original surface, and then as time goes on, we're going to move the surface in the normal direction. This is going to have the same kind of smoothing effect in a way, and we can ask, how does the area, for instance, of the smooth surface change? Area is a little easier to write down than volume, given what we've, what we've already done. Okay? So we can write down the area element at time t as, well, we take df wedge df. We know that that gives us twice nda. So inner product of n with df wedge df divided by 2 gives us the area element. So then df wedge df, expanding that a little bit, we can write that out as df plus tdn wedge df plus tdn. We can just plug in our definition of this family of surfaces. If we distribute the wedge over addition, we get four terms, two of which we can combine. So we get df wedge df plus 2t df wedge dn plus t squared dn wedge dn. And, oh yeah, we already did a lot of these calculations. We can turn df wedge df into area. We can turn df wedge dn into a mean curvature normal. We can turn dn wedge dn into a Gauss curvature normal. So we get 1 plus 2t mean curvature plus t squared Gauss curvature df wedge df. In other words, 
as we move the surface in the normal direction or as we smooth out the surface by mollifying it with this ball, the new area element, dA sub t, looks like the original area element times 1 plus twice the mean curvature times t plus t squared times the Gauss curvature. Again, a polynomial in the ball radius or the, the time. Pretty cool. Right? Notice the surface area is given by df wedge df. The spherical area, dn wedge dn, gives the Gauss curvature. And when we mix together the surface area and the spherical area, we get the mean curvature. So another nice perspective on where are these different curvatures coming from? Why are there these kind of basic quantities? Okay, hopefully that gives you a pretty nice picture of the interplay between smooth and discrete surfaces and their curvatures. We could go on and talk about the discrete curvature of n-dimensional manifolds. In fact, you could use this exact same machinery to define and understand discrete curvature in any dimension. Actually, the first thing you might want to do, because it's the easiest thing, is to go down in dimension and think about curves. How does the curvature of curves, which we've talked a lot about in this class, relate to this Minkowski picture? Well, we've drawn a picture right here. If you take a curve, a polygonal curve, and thicken it with a ball, then the curvature of this smoothed out curve shows up really only at the vertices. And the quantity that you get is related to this exterior angle kappa, which was one of our notions of discrete curvature, the turning angle. If we instead go up in dimension, we think about three manifolds, then we recover discrete analogs of classic notions of curvature for Riemannian manifolds. And these are actually quite difficult to get your head around in the smooth setting, especially because they're so difficult to visualize, but they actually have very easy definitions in the discrete case. So for instance, the scalar curvature for a three manifold, what is a discrete three manifold? It just means I'm gluing together a bunch of tetrahedra, okay? And we're gonna compare now the total solid angle around a given vertex to the area of the unit Euclidean sphere, right? If this set of tetrahedra come from ordinary flat three-dimensional space, then the angle of intersection that each tet makes with the sphere, when we sum those all up, we'll get four pi, we'll get the area of the sphere. But if these tets are curved in some way, we'll get a different quantity. We'll get a defect that's a lot like the two-dimensional angle defect. In particular, we can say the discrete scalar curvature S sub i, meaning the quantity at vertex i, is 4 pi minus the sum over all tetrahedra, i, j, k, l, that touch i, of this solid angle, which I've called psi sub i, j, k, l. Right, so this dark blue region on the sphere on the right. Another notion of curvature you have for three manifolds is the Riemann curvature, which in the discrete case is just going to be the difference between 2 pi and the total dihedral angle around an edge. So again, you can imagine if I have tetrahedra in flat Euclidean three-dimensional space, then around a given edge, these dihedral angles should add up to 2 pi. We can measure the deviation from 2 pi to get a sense of how curved this thing is. So Rij, the Riemann curvature associated with edge ij, is 2 pi minus the sum over all tetrahedra containing edge ij of the dihedral angle at edge ij in tet ijkl. Okay? In general, no matter what dimension you're working with, uh, you can consider the volume of the Minkowski sum of your manifold with a ball of radius epsilon, an n plus one dimensional ball, and taking derivatives with respect to epsilon of this volume will give you a way to get your hands on discrete curvature.
Okay, so there you have it. We already have some very powerful tools for thinking about curvature in both the smooth and discrete setting and connecting the two. And what we started to see today is that a lot of the standard discrete curvatures that you might see on a, a triangulated surface are actually connected in one unified picture. Next time, we're going to grow this picture even bigger by considering the variational point of view. All right, talk to you next time.